It is Monday, March 13th, 2017, and this is the Monday Morning Analyst. Thank you, everyone. My name is Luke Thomas. I am the host of this podcast here on MMAfighting.com. Three parts of the podcast, as always, an overview of the weekend, some things in particular we'll take a look at with some specificity, and then take a look at what's coming up in the weekend ahead. Uh, really only one event of consequence that we're going to dig into, but before we get into that, as we begin the podcast right away, I suppose, uh, I just want to sort of give a spotlight, if we can, to ACB, Absolute Championship Barracoot. They had ACB 54 over the weekend, and they've been making a number of headlines recently. They had a huge free, ag- uh, free agent acquisition push. They signed the likes of Zach Makovsky, Takeya Mizugaki, Luke Barnett, uh, Bubba Jenkins, Albert Tumanov, lots of different guys. And they had an event over this past weekend with a huge number of fights, I think over 20 fights or something like that, but a couple of ones to spotlight. By the way, number one, uh, also, Frank Mir is what their color commentator, who I think is criminally underused in mixed martial arts. I'm glad to see him get some perspective. Uh, I'm glad he has a platform to share his perspective uh, as an analyst because I think he is uh, really, really good at it. Um, but the results here were kind of incredible to talk about. We're not going to go through every single one. Just a couple of things to spotlight. Sal Rogers losing, by the way, to Ariel Pertia. Bubba Jenkins losing to what they're calling a reverse triangle choke to Ali Bagov. It was sort of like a triangle choke, right? but rather than the last leg clamping down, um, he used his own hand, Bagov did. But it was an angle where it was kind of twisted around, so like the calf was right in the throat. And I don't know if Jenkins didn't think it was on or what exactly but he got his his eyes rolled in the back of his head and by the way acb is really good about putting their results with video on social media their shows are free on youtube so um you can go and see all this for yourself really bad loss by the way for bubba jenkins i'm not sure what's next for him um but also on this card that was kind of amazing uh robert whiteford i believe put nam fan to sleep in like 21 seconds well like, look with, i couldn't quite tell but it appeared to be a 10 finger guillotine and then the main event mohammed kaladov stopping also in 21 seconds luke barnett you know mohammed kaladov did not spend his prime he's 37 years old i believe you know he lost his prime to uh you know competing in small organizations which is a long and storied moment which we won't really get to here for this podcast but you know, he's still obviously quite competitive he's athletic he can uh, really take advantage in this particular case of longer, tall fighters if you have a lazy jab. And, and so he made Barnett pay, and uh, it was a great show. It was a great free show with good commentary in English. So if you guys get a chance, check out their show. Uh, I'm not sure when the next one is, but um, they, they are making some waves, and we should pay attention to them. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about the UFC show. UFC Fight Night 106, UFC Fight Night Belfort versus Gastelum. This took place, and forgive my pronunciation, at the Centro de Forma Sao Olimpica de do Nordeste in Fortaleza, Brazil, at an attendance of 14,069, which was a sellout. I don't have exact gate figures for you at this juncture. Um, in the main event, Kelvin Gastelum defeating Vitor Belfort at 352 of the first round via TKO punches. What can we really say about this one? Things we already knew about Gastelum were already true. Um... He can compete at this weight class. I'm not saying he's necessarily going to be a title contender, although I wouldn't rule that out. But certainly he is a very capable competitor. I do think there is some kind of an asterisk, uh, asterisk on this one because he did fight an aging Belfort. He fought a guy who had, in, in Tim Kennedy, you know, a long layoff and then retired. I'd like to see him compete against some of the more youthful members of the division. But nevertheless, he obviously has great accurate punching, great power punching. Um, and... Uh, gave Vitor Belfort a lot of trouble. Belfort, as we thought, within the first three minutes, sometimes the first five, has great hand speed and good power, but that just simply wasn't enough. What really sort of got me was, I think, the first knockdown that uh, Gaston was able to score, Belfort never recovered from. It was a left hand that dropped him. Belfort did, in fact, get back up, which you'll notice what happens in the second one is Gastelum jabs into range, throws a cross that just misses. Maybe it glances him. Doesn't really land with impact is my point. But Belfort doesn't adjust. He just keeps his feet there. So what does Gastelum do? Bang, bang, another one, too, and sits him down with that. It was kind of weird. I don't know if Belfort was all there or he just doesn't have the athletic instincts anymore to be able to react to that. But it was a fairly bad loss for him. Somewhat expected, I suppose, but... Nevertheless, he's saying he wants his last fight to be his next one, which will be the end of his contract in June in Rio. We'll see if he gets it. I don't know what's going to happen with that. But, um, you know, obviously he's had a fairly storied career, but he was saying his body just isn't the same anymore, which I think is an understatement. But um, in any in any event, 
you know, not a whole lot new learned about Gastelum. He called out Anderson Silva. I don't know if they'll make that fight or not. Silva calling out Bisping and Nick Diaz on Instagram today. But nevertheless, some of the real positives that we have seen in Gastelum were reinforced in this fight. The accuracy, the power, the selection uh, of his offense. And I think all of those things are, are, are uh, you know, his strong suits. We'll see if he can continue as the uh, opposition gets better. Uh, Mauricio Shogun Hua defeating Jean Vellante at 59 seconds of the third round. This one you kind of knew what was going to happen in the sense that here are two guys with good offense, not the best defense in the world, and they're both light heavyweights. Someone's probably going to get cracked here and go down, but who's it going to be? The aging Shogun? Shogun's only 35, but he's got dog ears on him really at this point. Or Vellante, he's 31 and has good offense and is a big, strong kid. Um, but, um, you know, his defense has been his problem. He got dropped by a lot of different guys. Some cases he's recovered, some cases he hasn't. But it's been a consistent theme and a problem for him. And he actually even said in the post-fight presser that, like, you know, I kind of just went in there and slugged that with him. It's like people don't realize Vellante wrestled, I believe, D1 as well with Wyatt. Weidman um, uh, at Hofstra, and uh, you know, even uh, whatever the case, he can wrestle. He can do other things. It's kind of surprising that he just went in there and slugged it out with a guy who, you know, all things being equal, if they're just going to slug it out, it's not that you don't think that Volante can win, but a guy who's you know one of the most storied sluggers in the sport, you might lean his direction, and so that's what he. That's what ultimately happened. Uh, eventually, what. Volante comes in and just gets cracked with a right. And what I thought was really amazing was, and, and to an extent, Brian Stan pointed this out, was just how there were times that earlier in that fight, Shogun had him rocked and just didn't really do a lot. In this particular case, really rocked him and then was very careful about how he closed the distance to add weapons and add the frequency of attack. So he didn't just charge in. He kind of just waited I believe even used another kick and then an outside punch. And then once he got into range, actually angled off to the side. Didn't stand quite right in front of him. Kind of angled off to the side and then unloaded. And that was all she needed. You know, we're talking about a guy who not only is a devastating finisher, but a smart one at this point. And just really, really lethal in his ability to manage that kind of distance. So uh, good stuff from Shogun there. And Volante, you know, he's sort of up, he's down. I think he's still usable as a light heavyweight, but... Um, Man, the one Achilles heel he's really shown has been his striking defense. And in virtually all of his losses, that's what has cost him. Um, I don't know what he's going to do about it. Edson Barboza defeating Benil Dariush at 335 of the second round via KO flying knee. We're going to look at this in the second frame. Um, I don't want to spoil too much except to say... I think that Edson Barboza is absolutely a potential title contender in this division. I know he had that setback against Ferguson, but since then he has been on a tear. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, uh, really quite an incredible show from him on this one, even though it was also an equally incredible show from Dariush. It's just that for every, for every opportunity, for every effort, even if it's smart, clever, and well-executed, every style, every game plan has as an answer. And he found it, and it had devastating consequences. So um, we'll talk about that in the second segment in, in more uh, detail. Uh, Ray Borg defeating Juicier Formiga, 29-28 across the board. I think it's a pretty fair call. It, it was hard to say exactly because I thought the leg kicks of Formiga in that second round, you, you saw it kind of hurt. Um, it hurt uh, Borg, but in the end, it just wasn't necessarily enough to me. Borg, man, that uppercut, whoa. It covers distance quickly, and it lands with a lot of authority. He was crushing Formiga with, uh, in that first round. I think he landed it at least twice, certainly threatened it more often. Um, surprisingly, I thought Borg was, if not the better grappler, the more resilient one in scrambles. We're going to take a look at one of his, their scrambles in the third round. But in the end, just did more to win. Had de more devastating shots. Uh, and was a little bit busier in all the various departments. You know, Ray Borg is a surprising guy. He missed weight against Louis Smolka, but Smolka's a tough bastard. And Ray Borg kind of put it on him. And here he is against Juicio Formiga and did a really great job. So I am I think there are still some things he needs to clean up, but that might be your next title contender. You know, I don't know what they're going to do with Joseph Benavidez at flyweight, but Ray Borg has been impressive. He's kind of come out of nowhere, but he had a strong performance at UFC 207. He had a strong performance here. Kid's good, man. He's really, really good. So he doesn't blow you away with any one thing, but he can do a lot. He can do a lot of it well. He's hard to hold down. Um, you know, maybe some kickboxing things he can clean up, but 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 he's good. He's really, really good. Um, let's see, let's see. Let's keep going here. 
Marion Renault versus Betch Cohea reaching a majority draw, 29-27 and 228s. 228-28, I should say. So I don't really agree with it that there was a draw to me. Renault won that pretty cleanly, especially with that third round being an easy 10-8. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, look, what do you, what do you say about both uh, competitors? I thought that Renault's adjustment to land that question mark kick, you know, you had you had Betch kind of have her hands here. So she threw a kick and it went right over the top and cracked her. I wish she would have done that sooner because that was a big liability for Betch throughout the course of that fight. And then from finishing there, I thought Renault's grappling was good. And my initial impression was, why doesn't she use it more? I don't. I I wonder if she's been working on her striking so much that she's kind of forgotten about her grappling a little bit. Like at least insofar as MMA contacts are concerned, she has a good guard. You know, she has obviously good back takes, um, but it was a little bit loose in this fight. I'm not exactly sure what the reason for that is. Something to pay attention to, I suppose, in subsequent UFC uh, appearances. But she's got well-rounded skills. You know, it's just she's a little bit offensively. She makes adjustments a little too late. She, I feel like she sticks with what she had game planned for, and she'll get away from that, but she should do it a little bit sooner. She kind of just holds on to what the plan is. And I understand that, too. You're under pressure. You don't want to, you know, if something doesn't immediately work, you don't want to abandon it. But I think there could be a slight correction that should be available to her. So there's that. Um, in addition, uh, on the ground, you know, it's the ground and pound was heavy, but it wasn't enough to put Betch away, although Betch is tough. I will say in Betch's defense, I thought she looked better. You know, did she look like a world beater? No. Everyone likes to, you know, bag on her a little bit. But, um, you know, she was noticing opportunities and making adjustments accordingly. Her striking was crisper. Uh, it was more accurate. It was more disciplined. You know, she has clearly made some improvements. Do you want to attribute that to training at AKA or whatever the case may be? I don't know. But, um, you know, I know she's a sort of like a bit of a laughing stock to some extent, but I don't know how fair that is given what she's able to do in the division. And clearly she is getting better. You know, how good? That's certainly up for debate. But this is not necessarily the same woman who fought Ronda Rousey. Now, I'm not saying Rousey, even with all her problems, wouldn't go in there and smoke her again. I, I, I'm just saying, has Betch Cohea gotten noticeably better? Yes, she has. Um, and then Alex Oliveira defeating Tim Means via rear naked choke, 238 of the second round. Boy, the grip on Alex Oliveira must be really significant. If he's not draining himself, when he gets his hands clasped, he's a nightmare. And you think it's an easy thing to break. It's not. And you think that's an insignificant skill. And it's not. I noticed this on Twitter. Let me tell you something, man. If you can break someone's grip like that, and you can do it effectively and quickly, look at what Jose Aldo does. People get behind Jose Aldo, including Frankie Edgar in the first fight. But he breaks that grip, and he leans back into it goes waist forward shoulders back and then turns like people in for example we've talked about this before you know you look at um, referees position in division one wrestling and what do you see when those guys get up and they want to break those hands that they lean back waist forward shoulders back you want to push your weight into your opponent if you go this way they follow you if you lean your shoulders into them and put your feet out in front of you if the feet are here shoulders here you can push them and then turn and then you're ready to rock and that's exactly what he's able to do but if you can't break the wrists and break the grip you can't get a whole lot going obviously some of these things have to work together in conjunction my point being was tim means couldn't break that grip so what happens yes he was able to get to advanced defensive positions but if you can't break the grip alex Oliveira can just start over again it's it's tough man it's really really tough when you get a guy who's got that farm boy hardcore strength um, you know, it, 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 it's problematic for you. You don't think a lot of it. Everyone thinks about, oh, who's got the best uppercut and flying knee and and wrestling shot? Grip. Grip is huge. And if you got a good one, you can do a lot with it. This this is living proof. I also feel like Tim Means sort of re-engaging the clinch. I know he's comfortable there. He likes to fight in that phone booth kind of way where elbows can come in and short punches and you can dirty box a little bit. I know he excels there. But if you know you had problems with the guy's grip in the first round, he may want to rethink that strategy in the second round. So I think that cost him a little bit here. Um, Kevin Lee defeating Francisco Trinaldo. Rear naked choke, 312 of the second round. Boy, I love this performance with Kevin Lee. And I went back and I watched it a couple times more. My initial impression was that he got cleaned out in the first round. He got hurt in the first round, and he did some desperation wrestling in it. But it was a little bit – I mean, Trinaldo won the first round. Don't misunderstand me. But it wasn't quite the blowout that I thought it was. But in the second round, he was much better about sticking and moving. He wasn't getting caught with that left. That left from Trinaldo was quick. I don't think Kevin Lee expected it. The timing on it was really nice. He was catching him at just the right moment in his footwork lull. Um, so really, really sort of great assessments there from Masa Renduba. But to me, the difference was just the react Again, 
Guys who make adjustments between rounds. So what did he do when Masaranduba threw that left? You can watch Lee see it, and he throws a head kick to challenge it almost right away, and it lands, and that's what rocked him. And once it rocked him, he was able to so take over as the superior grappler that he was, at least against a hurt Masaranduba. And Brian Stan noted it as well. When that choke was on, it wasn't in. It was around the chin. And guys are doing this more and more. They're bowing out their opponent. So it's one thing to get the body triangle, which he did, although he was kind of off to the side. But when you get that choke, what you really want to do is if you can arch their back backwards, right? You naturally hunch over this way. If you can get them going the other way, get that thoracic and lumbar extension on them, it is, it is horribly painful. It is horribly painful. And yes, even with that, you can still keep your chin tucked. But the idea is that if you can bow someone out, they begin to open up here as well. And you can actually watch an elbow, his elbow just sort of sink into space um, as he does that on Trinaldo. So by the time the choke is in, now he's fully flexed out backwards. It's, it's super painful. Super, super, I mean, the spine's literally not supposed to go that way. It has some flexion. I mean, what is a submission? A submission, if it's not a choke, let's say it's sort of a limb submission, is to take a joint or some piece of the body in a direction it's not supposed to go. Right, either the opposite direction or too far of a direction where it does have some flexion. So your your spine has flexion, right? Your hand can go like this, but then breaking it all the way over, of course, causes problems. And they're pushing it to its max limit. It's horrible. It's a horrible, painful thing. So for me, the the ability to clinch up and save himself when he had a bit of a slow start for Kevin Lee was crucial. Making the adjustments in the second round, recognizing an offensive opportunity and reacting to it, and then of course taking over where he was dominant. I mean, great great win for a guy who's 24. I know he pisses some people off because he you know he mouths off on Twitter a lot, but Kevin Lee is a serious talent. I think he's got a lot of upside. The only thing is he's a bit of a slow starter. Um, he makes good adjustments. What I would like to see him is have a little bit more focus in that first round. Um, you know, maybe be a little bit, not much, just a little bit more active offensively in that first round, and I think he can do a lot with it. Sergio Moraes fighting Davi Ramos, defeating him 30-27 across the board. This was a remarkably terrible fight, and what the real problem with this one was, you know, if you know anything about Davi Ramos from grappling in 2015 ADCC, where he did the sitting guard flying armbar on Lucas Lepre, then you know that he's a dynamic, amazing grappler. You just got no sense of that whatsoever. Like, if this was your introduction to Davi Ramos, you knew nothing about him, you'd be like, this guy's just a so-so striker if that like what is so special about him so hopefully they can find out in subsequent matchups like they can put together something that like he's a real special talent you need to put him in matches and bouts that showcase that to an extent um joe soto defeating honey yaya 29 28 29 27 29 27 what a strong I mean, joe soto's run in the in the octagon has not been easy short notice fights tough opponents Go into people's backyards. He has done it all, man. And he is finally getting some quality wins and showing his quality. And you couldn't be happier for the guy. This was a great win. A headbutt was a real big moment. Obviously, the blood coming out and getting in the eyes of Joe Soto and all over the map. But in the end, I really think he got the better of that. I think that hurt Honey Yaya. And I don't, I don't, maybe he recovered. Maybe he didn't. But here's the point. While the blood got in the eye of Joe Soto, there were parts where, especially in that third round, man, where there were some deep potential positions from deep half and other kinds of overhook uh, with the legs and, and underhooking with the arms that Yaya had. He had some strong positions, and he couldn't do anything with them because that blood acted like a lubricant. He was able to just to slide right out, Joe Soto was. And so for me, um, you know, Joe Soto – I think is the deserving winner, and sometimes luck just breaks one way or the other. He was getting, he was just too patient in the first round. And Honey Yaya was, you know, how good of a striker is he? I don't know. How active was he offensively in that first round? Very. And I think that was a big key contributor. But over time, Soto showing more of his real well rounded skills, particularly in the wrestling department, threatening with that guillotine, forcing Yaya to go back down, you know, a la Smolka and Ben Wynn. Um, really great by him. That third round, um, he goes for an arm bar on Yaya, misses. I mean, he tried a lot of submissions, north-south chokes. that just never worked. Um, and he gets underneath and does not waste time. Puts his feet on the hips, pushes Yaya back, sits up while he does it, gets an underhook. And what does he do? He baseball slides in the same direction as the underhook and then corkscrews around and comes out on top and pushes away. 
What hustle from Joe Soto. What situational awareness from Joe uh, Soto. And what preparation from Joe Soto. He knew if he found himself underneath Honey Yaya, do not let this guy set up passing. Do not let him... If, if a guy... You guys know that meme where it's the black guy like pointing to his head. It's like, can't pass guard if there's no guard to pass. You know, it's kind of like one of those situations. Like, before his passing even gets started, deny him this. Deny him this. And that's exactly what he did. Great job there from Joe Soto just to have the, again, that kind of awareness um, that comes with experience and preparation for a particular opponent. That, to me, is evidence of what a full camp can give him. He executed perfectly, aggressively, but not, not, recklessly all the defensive maneuvers he need to underhooks baseball slide out corkscrew on top push away brilliant job from joe soto there uh michelle prezeris just absolutely cr- crushing josh berkman with that north south choke berkman even got the hand in on the far side bar- bicep but it wasn't enough the guy was just able to get too much um you know shoulder and lat involvement in that one uh, Jeremy Kennedy defeating Hani Jason, 29-28, 29-28, 29-27. Great recovery from Kennedy. Good, strong, well-rounded grappling game from Kennedy. Kennedy, another guy working out underneath. And by the way, interestingly, great ground and pound from Kennedy. And you saw this in two fights. You saw it in the Borg um, uh, Formiga fight, and you saw it in this one. You've seen a lot of guys underneath. What do they want to do? In this particular case, it was Jason. He get, They get an overhook with one arm, right? And so they trap the other guy's arm. The other guy, when you do that, when you hold his arm, you're giving him a weight to balance against. And so they're hammering guys with elbows over the top. You saw that both those fights. So if you're going to overhook with a guy, boy, your other hand better be doing something to either protect you or bicep control something. Because just letting them uncork on you like that is going to be painful. So in the end, Jeremy Kennedy, a bit of a better grappler, at least in MMA context. I don't think in pure jiu-jitsu, but certainly in MMA context. Tremendous, accurate, fluid, instinctive ground and pound that he had. Really great stuff from him for a UFC debut. And after getting floored with a knee, good resiliency too, man. Tough kid, that Canadian. Um, and then this dude who looks like he just stepped off the Arnold Classic stage, Paulo Henrique Costa Bohachinha defeats Gareth McClellan. I mean, how good is Bohachinha? I don't know. Uh, he overwhelmed McClellan, who is a you know meat and potatoes solid fighter. Uh, this was at 117 of the first round. There was a couple times Bohachinha got caught. I, I don't know how good he is. I guess we'll see. But he certainly, uh, you know, as Ben Folks would say, looks good getting off the bus. Um, okay, with that out of the way, let's do this. Let's now take a look at. The Edson Barboza Benil Dariush fight, which to me was the best one of the weekend and the most important and impactful one. And then in the third segment, we'll take a look at what's coming up ahead. Let's do that now. So let's look in detail about. Let's look more in detail in this Benil Dariush Edson Barboza fight. Um, a lot of takeaways I think you can have, and we'll go through a number of them, some bigger than others. But some of the ones that stand out to me is why did this work? Why did this. this flying knee what was it why was it so successful in the way that it was a lot of different answers for that obviously Edson Barboza's timing on this is incredible obviously his athleticism and sort of situational awareness you know combined with the timing all of it works together to create these devastating consequences all of those are totally fair totally appropriate takeaways but to me it's a little bit bigger than that you know, I went back and I watched the Tony Ferguson fight, which is the last fight Barboza has lost, right? He lost to Tony Ferguson, then beat Anthony Pettis, then beat Gilbert Melendez, and now has beaten Benil Dariush. Boy, that is not too shabby, right? You could even argue he was winning the first round against uh, Ferguson, who, by the way, had a point taken away for an upkick when a failed leg lock attempt, essentially. But that's neither here nor there. What the big takeaway was from that bout was Ferguson fought like he normally does these days, where he just puts unbelievable pressure on guys and backs them up and backs them up and backs them up. That's that's a big component of it. Um, and of course he had these, you know, his diverse entries where he's leading with uppercuts and changing stances and, and he really had uh, Barboza flummoxed. Now, an interesting detail to that fight was that it took place in the smaller cage. It, it took place on an Ultimate Fighter card. I really think that affected him. But But this is the point. Barboza basically knows now that, look, some guys like Paul Felder might stand with him at range, and that's great, and you can slug it out with those guys when they do. But a lot of guys who have like good striking, which is what I would say Benil Dariush has, certainly more than functional striking, they're going to put the pace on you. They're going to try and pressure you. They're going to try and back you up. 
to me, the big lesson here in watching what Barboza does is that he is now developing answers to those kinds of problems. He didn't have one against Tony Ferguson. And again, I think Ferguson was partly aided by um, that smaller cage, which did not uh, was not available to Darius in this case. But the other answer is that, look, if you can back him up, if you can put the pressure on him, you really can take away his kicking game. Not completely, but man, you can make a big dent in it. And his kicking game is sort of central to a lot of his other parts of his offense. So you, to an extent, shut down the offense generally. And here's the truth about Benil Dariush in this fight. Before getting KO'd, he was doing great. Really great. I feel terrible for him. Now look, he entered into this contest willingly. Uh, he signed up for this challenge on his own. He asked for a tough fight. I mean, you know, I don't have sympathy for him in that sense. But this is not a guy who was doing a lot of things wrong. This was a guy who, and we'll go through these slides. I'm not going to go through every single exchange, but you'll see. Number one, he was first on offense so often. Number two, he was disguising his offense. He was making it hard for Barboza to read. If Barboza managed to land, Dariush would respond every single time. If Dariush threw a strike, he would throw two or three behind it to make sure he covered himself, to really sort of stick it to Barboza. And not all, always in linear attacks, sometimes at angles. right? So he's going high, low, side to side. He's leading with his cross. He's pumping behind the jab. He's doing a lot of different things all correctly, and he won that first round, not merely on my scorecard or maybe yours. All three judges gave it to him, and he was well on his way to winning the second. And in the end, it just didn't matter because this guy on the right of your screen, Edson Barboza, is just a tremendous athletic talent and took advantage of maybe one of the problems, maybe the central problem, that Dariush could not get away from. Namely, there is no such thing as a free lunch. The game plan that Dariush was employing was right, and the execution of it was good. It's just that there's no such thing as the perfect game plan. Whatever... Whatever style you bring, whatever game plan you employ, there's always going to be some kind of answer for it. Now, some of those answers are easier to come by than others, and you'll see that, like, look, Barboza never threw this previously in the course of the fight. This is the first time he threw it. Turned out to be only the only time he needed to try it, but you get the idea. He didn't have a ton of responses. It just so happens that the real one that he mustered... Um, was all that he needed in the end. I'm just saying there's always a cost to be paid for your style. No matter what it is, there's a cost to be paid for your game plan. There's always some kind of answer for it. And you're going to see Barboza just eventually takes advantage of that. It took him a round and a half to kind of figure it out, but that's what he's going to do. Now, well, let's go through these slides. You're going to see, I mean, so much of this that Darius does is correct. Here's the one thing to home in on. Look at how far apart they are. What you'll see a, both of them do a lot is they're going to lean heavy on that front leg, especially Dariush. But what Dariush does is he's going to leap into range a lot. Big strikes. He's going to try, look at their opposite side stance, right? Southpaw versus orthodox. Pay attention to the lead foot of Dariush. He's going to try and get that to the outside of Barboza. But look how far away he is. I think what Barboza recognized is when Dariush was just jabbing and not really, really committing to it, and when he was really stepping in to throw, to back up, to put a solid attack behind the leading punch, or whatever the case may be, we'll go through some of these slides. So look, look how far apart he is. Always remember that. Let's go through the slides. Here he's going to step in a little bit further. You can even see he catches Barboza stepping in a little bit further. This is going to be a common, common refrain. He goes through. You're going to see, not so much from this slide, but from subsequent ones, how well Dariush disguised his kicks with that left leg. He does a really good job of it. But watch. Throws a big strike and is going to use that to leap in to range. But Barboza's wise to it and circles back out again. Right? But just remember, this is going to keep happening and keep happening and keep happening. So we now jump to 354 of the first round. Here we are. Look how far apart they are. No way he's close enough. He's sort of in kicking range here, almost outside of kicking range to an extent, and he wants to get into range boxing range or even sort of clinch range that's really he really wants to be with barboza so he's going to take big long steps and that's eventually going to spell his demise 
But, you know, what are you supposed to do? You can't stand at kicking range. you got to be all the way in or all the way out. And that's what he was trying to execute here. I completely understand Dariush's perspective on this one, to be honest. So here's what he's going to do. They're going to step in a little bit closer. He's going to slip to the outside of a jab. He's going to throw his own. Look at the outside foot positioning, but look how long that step is. Look at it from heel to, 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 to fist. Such a huge extension. He's trying to get in there, right? And then he comes through and actually hits sort of like a shovel punch with the right. Always putting attacks behind his initial leading attack, right? And then you see he tries to throw a left. Doesn't really come close. All right. We jump a little bit, a few seconds later. You look, look at him just, we're not talking about huge gaps in time. He is always putting the pressure on, on Barboza. Here we go. Steps to the outside. Look at how wide this is. Slips the jab, and he's going to come over with his own left. Good job by Barboza of, of anticipating that and kind of blocks it. Good job. And not only that, kind of like leans into it to really create a shield. Barboza's got good striking. We already knew that, but he's got good defense too. All right, and he tries to catch him with a hook, and you can see Barboza's on his bike all the way out. This is where a smaller cage would make it a lot harder, by the way. 316. And again, these are not all the strikes. I'm just sort of showing you a general pattern here. Watch him. Watch what he does here. He's going to take a look. I mean, look at how far apart he is. Really outside of kicking range. So he's going to take a step, and he's going to sort of drop to the right. He gets cracked coming in by Barboza. Barboza reads it. And he throws this shot to the ribs. He does this several times throughout the fight. One more time just to see it. He's outside. He's going to dip and look like he's going to throw a jab almost. This, in this case, he doesn't. He doesn't another time. Throws a left over the top, gets caught, but digs that to the body. And now he's in tight where he wants to be. And there he is. See him grabbing the clinch. Barboza wants no part of it. He'll eventually escape. But you see the idea. Now we're at 258. We keep going. They're a little bit closer this time. This is what I mean when I say Dariush does a good job. Dariush does this big wind-up here on all of the kicks he throws, and it really gave Barboza problems because what you'll find is that this looks like he's throwing. He's throwing his head back. He's got this wide motion to create balance, like he's going to throw this like a head kick. And he was throwing this to the, to the leg, to the body, upstairs, really mixing it up. Did a great job. It really gave Barboza serious problems. This case, he goes... I believe, to the middle when this picture renders. Yep, right to the middle. Barboza kind of sort of reads it, gets two hands up to protect himself, but you can see, not not like, he stepped out of range, so he got out of the way, but you can see in terms of where Barboza thought this was coming, he was confused. <sighs> Man, you got to feel bad for Dariush, right? 145, still in the first round. Look at how far apart they are, almost outside of kicking range, right? So he needs to close that distance. So what's he going to do? He's going to sort of paw, take a big step, and he's going to try and leap in uh, to, after a jab with the sort of left. He gets caught a little bit, and it's the same kind of knee we saw previously. Right? One more time. He's outside. He's going to take a step in. Right? Kind of fakes the jab. He's so going to throw a left over the top. Almost gets caught with it again, this time with a right instead of a left. And then, boom, cracks him. And now he's on the inside, and he wants to stay there. Now we're in the second round. Now here's kind of interesting. Darius slowed down in the second round just a little bit. Not significantly, certainly not in some kind of major way, but noticeably, a noticeable tick down. That, I think, you could attribute maybe to some of the body work that Barboza was landing. He was able to land a couple of hard real body shots there, either teeps or even sort of just a roundhouse. They, they were, I think, having some kind of effect. Now, that's speculative, but whatever the reason... He slowed down just a little bit in that second round. Let's see if we can sort of pick up on what that might have done for him. But again, you know, outside the uh, pocket, way outside, even kicking range, he's going to want to step inside with a hard jab. He does so at an angle. Comes to the outside, you can still he's still pretty far away. And he, he I think he gets cracked with this one. But you can see he's kind of close enough now, and he wants to follow with a left hand and doesn't do it. This is my point. Big step from the outside, always following an attack side to side, bringing something behind an initial push. Only once or twice in this whole fight is he like jab and throw nothing else behind it. Right? And Barboza sort of reading it. Uh, okay, here we go. 342. Leans off to the side. Right? Steps in with a hard jab as he kind of fakes and then comes back over the top. And then he goes with a single leg. That's a nice, deep single. Now, we know he doesn't really commit to it. He kind of holds on, but Barboza pretty quickly gets his knee past this line of his uh, elbows, in which case you're done. If you, don't, if, you, if you don't have 
if you have if their knee is past what you're controlling, you have not on anybody who's any good. And you can see here he pulls past and then he gets out. So that's no big deal. He was more just threatening. He was more just threatening, right? And remember how he threatened it off that jab from away. Leans off, throws a jab, and then moves in right away. Boom. Right away. Okay? He's always bringing attacks behind his initial attack, which is what you're supposed to do. Okay. So let's go. Here we are, 314. Takes another step inside from way out of range. Tries to tries to jab his way in, sort of from boxing range here, but long boxing range, and then tries to throw a body shot. Look at look at looks like he's running. I mean, these are huge steps he's taking here. Barboza reads it and gets out of the way. Here's another one, 234. Watch him run at Barboza here. Like st fakes the jab to the outside. Tries to come over with the left, but he's, you can see he's lunging, you know, because he's trying to be so mindful of the distance. Barboza does that to guys. They know if you stand at kicking range, he'll light you on fire. And if you just run in, he'll catch you. you got to put attacks together in combination. you got to put things to get him paying attention. you got to put things behind it. Dariush was doing it right, man. He was doing it right. All right, and he chases him away. 224 now, the second round. Here they are. Semi in kicking range here. In kicking range, I'd say. Steps in. Boom. Fires a left over the top. And he's going to try and throw a shovel punch there with the right. Barboza leans off to the side and, and tries to counter here a little bit. This is where he was able to get countered a little bit. If they were exchanging in the pocket, if he threw something, um, you know, Dariush kind of got caught, clipped a couple of times. But if you go back and you listen to the corner audio of Barboza, one of the major issues he has was retracting his, his hands in these kinds of exchanges and getting caught. Mark Henry was screaming at him to protect himself at the end of his strikes. Really bring that hand back. Don't be lazy with the jab or the cross um, because because Dariush was putting so many strikes together in linear paths. It was really creating problems for him. All right, and then he clinches up, whatever. 216, look at how far apart they are. You see the patterns beginning to emerge? All right, takes a step in, and you can see this is a big step. Boom, jabs, but... Back foot doesn't really leave the ground. Catches Barboza, and look at how far apart the distance was. I think Barboza could tell when this guy was committing to something because he doesn't. Barboza catches him, look, stays up leaning. So here's Darius trying to confuse him. Here I am bringing attacks behind my jab. I'm bringing attacks behind my cross because I want you to be able to, I want you to force to cover up, and that leaves me openings elsewhere. I don't want you to have any chance to retaliate as I sort of just make you duck and cover. Uh, with what I'm doing here, he just jabs him. But you'll notice, look at how far apart the foot positioning is. He, I think Barboza can feel it a little bit here, right? That's the only time in this round he does that. By the way, here he is pressuring him again. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Here comes Dariush. What's he gonna do? He's gonna fake the jab. He's gonna lower his level, and you see Barboza gonna lean off to the right and get out of the way, right? Look at that circling out. You, he can feel that pressure. And I think believe I believe now we are approaching the beginning of the end. And there's a couple things here I sort of want to point out. They're at sort of kicking distance here, you know, kicking distance maybe, right? Something like that, All right? What's he gonna do? He takes a big step, fakes the jab, or not fakes the jab. Excuse me, lands the jab. But here you can see the foot coming off, and you can see Barboza feels it right away. You know, in my initial impression, I thought it had actually missed, and Barboza read that he was clearly just waving it to come in i think it's a little bit different actually it turns out that it actually landed with a good authority it pops his head back a little bit and i think that in addition to maybe whatever else barboza saw he knew he was constantly coming with these attacks he knew if he threw a jab there was almost a guaranteed response that there was going to be something else behind it and barboza reads it so what does he do watch i mean before he can even really level change barboza's already what's he what's, what's he going to do Commonly what is taught here is that you know if whatever hip is forward, you're going to jump in the air and then turn the opposite hip. So in this case, it's going to be his right side of his hip is going to come forward. And this is going to almost be like an uppercut, right? Which is kind of funny. He didn't mean to land it as Darius shot. In fact, you kind of want to hit him at the, t at the very end of the arc where almost knee is level with the waist. But there's something else here Barboza does that is so athletic. So let's watch this slide. I mean, look at what he does here. I mean, poor, poor Dariush just had no... I mean, this this point, the fight's over, right? Um, so watch this. Boom. Look at the knee here. Two things about this. 
first of all, he catches them, I mean, so hard. If you're leaning into it and they're bringing it up, you know, you're just talking about an incredible amount of force. But normally you can hit this on someone. They don't have to be shooting. I mean, this is in, this comes from, you know, I'm not sure of all the traditions that use this, but certainly Muay Thai uses this. For someone who might be leaning heavy or trying to close a lot of distance, really stepping in hard. You saw Paul Felder do something different with that up elbow, right? That step in elbow. Uh, in his last fight, as the guy was, you know, coming like with these these long steps to close distance, and they're really committing some weight from the rear heel to the front foot, you can catch them coming in. This is a similar kind of concept about someone who's trying to close distance, trying to really step through on things. But normally, you can catch them even if they're, you know, relatively upright at the end of the arc. He catches them sort of two thirds, three fourths maybe even five-sixths of the way up, but still plenty powerful. But this is the other part to me. Let's see if it's here. This is the one that really just sort of like amazes me. Look at his arms. What do you notice about his arms here, Edson Barboza? Normally when this is when this is taught, it's you want to have this side of, you, you, you know, whatever side you're bringing forward, you bring your arms to the, you know, almost in the same, uh, excuse me, opposite direction to control. Right, so you don't over twist. If you throw your arms to the same side you're twisting, you might over twist. You don't want to over twist. Here's my point: he doesn't bring his arms in either direction. They're basically straight out in front of him. In other words, this is an insane amount of body control. This is this is incredible by Edson Barboza to be able to leap into the air, to time it in the way he did, to know his opponent was going to be there. All those things are incredible, yes, and to get you know that kind of height and uh, all that stuff, but to have the body control where you can coordinate this kind of attack and keep your balance while still being lethal, while still throwing where you need to accurately and not use really some of the tools of balancing in the upper body to do it, bro, <laughs> whoa. Edson Barboza is athletic. This, this is what I mean when someone's like, oh, he's athletic and explosive. <laughs> no, 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 for real. Super, super athletic move by Edson Barboza. Everyone talks about the timing on this. Yes, of course. The timing is gorgeous on this thing. But also, just note how much muscular and sort of motor control Edson Barboza has. He's not using any part of his upper body to really help him balance and coordinate this attack. He can do it just looking, leaping, and timing of his own natural ath athletic ability. That that is a, that is amazing. You don't see that all that often. Whoa. Great job by him. Let's look at this at some other angles. And, of course, he falls to the ground. By the way, one quick note about this. Look what Edson Barboza does. He goes and, you know, gets congratulated by his corner, but then he goes to Dariusha's corner, right? And I think he's sort of telling them, you know, obviously this is not personal. This is just business. I hope he's okay. And his corner, this is this is not his own corner. This is the corner of um, Benil Dariush. So I really, really respect that from Edson Barboza. Here he is talking to, to, to Dariush's corner. So shots to Edson Barboza for being an incredible sportsman and sort of recognizing the moment after a devastating KO. You have every right to celebrate, but also, you know, paying respect to your opponent in their corner is, is a good thing to do. All right, let's take a look at this from another angle. You're going to see him try to take... Look how far apart he is. He's going to take such a big step. Barboza sees it, man. Boom, look at this. And you can see Barboza's already in motion. He can feel how hard that was. He could just tell because he had done it so many times. He had stepped hard so many times. He had motion so many times. He just knew it was coming, right? Retracts it, begins to lower. Barboza's already in motion. Already knew it was coming. As soon as that jab maybe was even thrown, he kind of knew it was coming, Right? Look at him twist. Look at his arms, bro. God. Total body control to be able to do something like that. That is so impressive. So you just, I mean, how many strikers in the UFC could do this? Not many. It, you know, on a, on, a, on a heavy bag or, you know, like a wall bag or something. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, sure, you know, but, but on a real live person, uh, you know, arguably a top 10 light, lightweight, psh, Forget it. Nightmarish. Nightmarish stuff. Here's another angle out one more time. Watch. Look how hard he's jabbing. Foot's coming off the ground. You can, and Barboza can feel it. And I think it's because he could feel the weight of it. He knew. So as soon as he lowered it, I mean, Barboza's already in motion. Boom. Here he comes and explodes. 
and there are the arms of Edson Barboza. Incredible, man. What an athlete this guy is. And he just crushes him. Man, what do you say about that? Dariush doing everything he needed to, but the one gap in in his style, the one chink in the armor, wasn't a big one. But someone like Edson Barboza is still able to take advantage of it. Credit to Dariush for, I think, putting on a strong performance and all the credit in the world to someone like Edson Barboza, who is developing answers to guys who have developed what I would consider to be good strategies against him. He is getting better, ladies and gentlemen. He is getting smarter. He is using his natural gifts and combining that with high fight IQ. How often he's going to pull off things like this? Not not very often. But that he is capable of it, he has put everyone on notice. Sensational job, Edson Barboza. Last but certainly not least, let's take a look at what's coming up in the week ahead. Uh, two fights, two events that I am aware of. Um, anyway, I'm sure there's always smaller events, but some of the bigger ones. Number one, there is a World Series of Fighting event on uh, the 18th. So be on the lookout for that. What day is it today? Today's the 13th, right? All right, so on the 18th, um, this is going to be World Series of F- Fighting 35, Ivanov versus Jordan. Bogoy Ivanov taking on Sean Jordan in the main event. Lance Palmer returns to action against Andre Harrison. Andre Harrison, by the way, has a win over a number of UFC vets. Undefeated kid. Keep an eye on him. Um, Bek Bulat Magomedov, uh, 17-1, taking on Donovan Frilo. Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, I'm sure you're all familiar with him, takes on Matt Sakor, And then Hakeem Dawadu versus Steven Seiler. Uh, Islam Mamadov also on that card, as well as a couple of other prospects. And then, of course, on also on the 18th, in London, England, at the O2 Arena on March 18th. Oh, and by the way, that World Series of Fighting card is going to be at the Turning Stone Resort Casino in Verona, New York. I believe there was a Combate Americas card up there not too long ago. The one that um, uh, Matt Hamill uh, fought on. Uh, okay, but UFC Fight Night 107. Uh, this was Manuel versus Anderson again at the O2 Arena in London, England. Uh, this is on Fight Pass. This will take place um, the main event: Manuel versus Corey Anderson, Gunnar Nelson versus Alan Jaban. Great fight there. Brad Pickett, I believe, in his retirement fight versus Marlon Vera. Arnold Allen taking on Makwan Amir Khani on the prelim card. The last fight on his contract: Joseph Duffy returns against Reza Madadi. Darren Stewart versus Francis Marbahosa. Daniel Omi Lanchuk versus Timothy Johnson at heavyweight. I can't pronounce his name ever. Mark Diakisi, Mark Diakis, whatever, versus Timu Pakalin. Tom Breeze returns against Aluale Bambose or Bambos. Uh, Leon Edwards versus Vicente Luque. That's a good fight. Ian Entwistle returns against Brett Johns. Bradley Scott versus Scott Askham. And then Lena Landsberg versus uh, Bantamweight versus Lucy Pudilla. Pudilova. All right. So there you go. If you have any questions, email me, luke.thomas at sbnation.com. You can uh, like me on Facebook at the link described below. Please do that. And I appreciate you guys watching. Subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up. Share it with all your friends. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the fights.